Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to today's seminar. This uh, seminar is hosted at a meeting of the Delta Lead Scientist Interview Panel, uh, which serves as an advisory committee for the Delta Independent Science Board. The interview panel in consists of representatives from the Delta Independent Science Board, the Delta Stewardship Council, and the USGS. In accordance with federal, state, and local guidelines to protect public health and safety in response to coronavirus disease, this meeting will be conducted entirely by remote access. The USGS and Delta Stewardship Council are recruiting the next Delta lead scientist whom is appointed by the council after consultation with the Delta Independent Science Board. As part of the process, each applicant will give a seminar presentation on their research and experience and how it applies to the position, as well as their vision for the Delta Science Program. Following each seminar, there will be a meet and greet opportunity to ask general questions. Today's seminar is the final of our four seminars. These seminars and meet and greet sessions provide an opportunity for the public to learn more about the applicant. At this point, I'd like to call a roll for the interview panel members. Um, I'll begin with myself, Elizabeth Canuel, Chair of the Delta Independent Science Board. Uh, and, and now I'll call roll. Tracy Collier. Present. Steve Brandt. Present by WebEx. Okay. Jessica Pearson. Present. Randy Fiorini. Uh, Susan Tatayan. Present. And Mike Chutkowski. Present. Thank you. I'd like to introduce today's candidate for the Delta Lead Scientist position, Dr. Laurel Larson. Dr. Larson is an associate professor in the departments of geography and civil and environmental engineering at UC Berkeley. She is currently on sabbatical as a Fulbright. Sastamoyan Fellow in Environmental Science at the University of Eastern Finland. She received her PhD from the University of Colorado, and her work focuses primarily on how flowing water structures the form and function of landscapes, with emphasis on the Florida Everglades, southern Louisiana, and streams and watersheds across the U.S including intermittent streams in coastal California. Dr. Larson's Environmental Systems Dynamics Laboratory takes a complex systems approach to environmental problems, seeking to understand the set of interactions and feedbacks that produce surprising or unanticipated behaviors. Her research has helped to identify the most critical drivers of landscape scale change and generate predictions about how landscapes will respond to climate change or changes in management. The seminar format for today is that we will begin with a presentation by Dr. Larson. Um, Dr. Larson will give her brown bag seminar and we will take written and oral questions following the seminar. You will be able to type written questions by emailing them to the Delta ISB, sorry, DISB at deltacouncil.ca.gov or using the chat function in WebEx. Afterwards, staff will read your questions to the candidates. If you prefer to provide oral comments, please use the raise hand function in WebEx. So at, at this point, I'd like to turn the um, podium over to Dr. Laurel Larson. 
Um, her presentation today is titled, Just Pour Water on It, Killing the Wicked Witch of the West and Other Myths with Restoration Science. Thank you and, and welcome today. Thank you, Liz. And I did decide to let to slightly modify my title to Melting the Wicked Witch of the West and Other Challenges with Re Restoration Science. But thanks to you all for giving me the chance to connect with all of you despite these extraordinary circumstances. In my work, as Liz said, uh, I approach environmental challenges, many of which deal with restoration from a systems perspective. Today, I hope to use this time to exemplify this approach and the perspectives and the insights that it has produced. I'll start out by giving an overview of my work and then go into more detail with a few vignettes. And finally, I'll conclude by discussing my priorities and ideas for the Delta lead scientist position. The title of my talk, of course, uh, I'm trying to advance the slide, but there seems to be a little bit of a delay. There we go. The title of my talk, of course, refers to the well-known reference to the Delta as a formally wicked problem or one that cannot be solved in the traditional sense but can be managed with appropriate knowledge and flexible institutions. This reference in turn comes from the wicked problem frame first proposed by Riddle and Weber in 1972. One aspect of their description of a wicked problem that most resonates with me is that here, a linear, traditionally scientific approach to problem solving would not capture the dynamics of complex systems and their quote unquote waves of repercussions that ripple through systemic networks. As Sam Luoma, Cliff Dom, and others have acknowledged, restoration science gives us some of the tools to understand and anticipate these complex nonlinear changes and hence to manage for them. While it would be naive of me to claim that the solution is ever just as simple as pouring water into the system, I do hope to show how restoration science can melt away some aspects of these wicked challenges, at least making these complex systems a little bit easier to understand or allowing us to better define our management objectives or anticipated outcomes. And yes, all of the examples that I'll go, go through today do involve some form of hydrologic manipulation. So as any good geographer should, let me start this introduction with a map. Here is a graphical display of my career in restoration science thus far, which spans projects ranging from small in scale, like these coastal salmon streams, to large, like the Everglades and Chesapeake Bay, and upon which I'll be drawing insights today. The system that I've worked on most intensively in my career is the Everglades, where my initial work focused on using a variety of methods to understand the processes responsible for the ridge and slough landscape structure that you see here uh, in the upper right. Here, the gray features that you see that are well connected are the, the waterways, which are important for fish and wading bird populations. My work also focused on the processes responsible for the widespread degradation of this landscape, which typically has led to a loss of this open channel habitat. This work contributed to the establishment of uh, flow velocity targets for an adaptive management experiment involving pul pulsed flow releases from new gated culverts that were put into levees um, in order to reestablish the patterns of sediment transport that our previous work suggested was necessary to maintain landscape structure. Some of the methods that we developed in the Everglades, such as in situ flow manipulation experiments in field flumes, became part of a project to evaluate how different types of vegetation communities differentially promote sediment accretion in one of the only parts of the Louisiana coastline experiencing land aggradation instead of net subsidence today. The objective here was, was for this work to lead to the improvement of the numerical models that are being used to anticipate the long-term effects of engineered diversions, and also to evaluate whether vegetation communities should be or should and could be actively managed in such a way so as to promote maximal sedimentation. As a USGS scientist from 2008 to 2012, I worked as a part of the larger Chesapeake Bay restoration effort to understand how stream restoration within upper parts of the watershed influenced the downstream transport of nutrients, sediment, and carbon. Recognizing that these watershed transport processes can have large cumulative effects at the scale of the Chesapeake Bay, as is apparent in this widely used image of the aftermath of Tropical Storm Lee, 
President Obama's 2009 executive order on protection and restoration of, Ches of the Chesapeake Bay promoted a renewed interest in stream restoration. I had the opportunity to work on understanding the biogeochemical and geomorphic impacts of two very different types of stream restoration used in an agricultural and an urban setting. A little closer to home in California, and a bit more recently, I worked with fish ecologist Stephanie Carlson and socio-environmental scientist Cleo Wolfley Erskine to understand how hydrologic manipulation of intermittent streams, like the one that you see here, uh, which disconnect into a series of pools during the summertime, which you could also see in this photograph, might enhance the survival of coho salmon and steelhead trout. Small coastal water boards had secured funding for off-stream storage of winter flows, and were interested in how best to use that water to balance agricultural needs with salmonid populations. More on that later. Last, I'm now spending my sabbatical year in Finland, which has about a third of its land area occupied by peat soils, which of course are common in the Delta. About half of that area is drained for forestry operations, so this is a hugely economically important ecosystem. Collectively, boreal peatlands hold about 60% of the total carbon that is in the atmosphere and about a third of the carbon in soils, so they constitute a huge global store. I'm using my time in Finland to conduct a data-driven study of how carbon and water cycles interact in different types of peatlands and control methane and carbon dioxide fluxes to the atmosphere. A big question here is how water management of peatlands harvested for forestry might impact greenhouse gas emissions to the atmosphere. So far, in the places compiled in my synthesis at this point, which is still fairly early on, I'm finding that these emissions are relatively insensitive to water table location and surprisingly insensitive to temperature, but highly sensitive to the types of vegetation present and its productivity. So returning to this map, perhaps conspicuously absent in this list is the Bay Delta. Admittedly, I am an outsider candidate for this position. But having become familiar with the challenges faced in managing this extraordinary ecosystem through my role on campus as a professor of water resources, I do feel comfortable venturing to say that many of the challenges faced in these other systems are quite similar to the challenges faced here. And these include things like land subsidence and species invasions in the Everglades in Louisiana, loss of peat in the Everglades and the boreal landscapes, water quality concerns in the Chesapeake Bay and Everglades, groundwater issues and coastal salmon streams, the need to promote habitat that supports wildlife in all locations, and the complexities of governance amidst many stakeholder groups and institutions also in all locations. And I believe that much of the insight and experience that I've gained in these other systems is quite transferable to the Delta and may even infuse some new ideas into this community. In terms of the research methods that I've used, they're fairly wide ranging. I've developed landscape scale and also small scale models of coupled flow, sediment, vegetation, and nutrient transport processes in wetlands. And my lab group is currently working on benchmarking and assessment of the National Hydrologic Model and the National Water Model that are both under development by government agencies for flow forecasting. To support the development of new models of poorly understood processes, particularly in the Everglades, I've conducted experimental manipulative studies in the field and also in laboratory flumes, typically involving some combination of flow manipulation and tracer introduction. I've also conducted observational field studies ranging from the installation of new USGS gauging and water quality stations uh, to sampling studies. Many of my wet lab capabilities at Berkeley involve analysis of dissolved organic carbon, which we use to fingerprint and trace the source of water and sediment. The biggest emphasis of my lab right now, though, is on data-driven studies that involve the synthesis of large flow and hydrometeorological data sets. In a USGS Powell Center working group that I'm co-leading, we are applying new techniques from information theory to these data sets in order to understand how long it takes signals from precipitation to be propagated into stream flow, and we're also using machine learning to forecast stream flow behavior in a way that captures the essential lag times and feedbacks. In engaging all of these methods, my work has required substantive collaborations with people from many disciplines shown here, and also from government, academia, and industry.
Methods that we have developed have in turn been useful for applied problems in other disciplines. And one example that I like to talk about is uh, that fish ecologist Simeon Urich, who's now at the USGS, and Joel Trexler at Florida International University, used a directional connectivity index that we had developed as a performance indicator of landscape pattern in order to understand how spatially explicit hydrological processes impacted fish movement in the Everglades. And that was within a modeling framework. So this seems like an appropriate place to acknowledge the collaborators whose work I will be presenting on today, as well as the funding sources for this work. And these are only the collaborators uh, whose work has highly contributed to what I'm presenting today. Uh, but there are many more. And this includes scientists from various agencies and academia, and then the last few people in the list are or have been students or postdocs in my lab at Berkeley. So that's enough of an introduction to me. Next, I want to get into some of the insights gained through these different projects that really cross cut across the different locations. Given the title of the talk, it makes sense to start with the sentiment, just pour water on it. And well, this is probably obvious to all of you, but water has many different dimensions. And there are many complexities that come into play with considering hydrologic manipulation as a management tool. A lot of my thinking on this is informed by my work in the Everglades on SERP, also known as the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan. The operational model, I'm sorry, the operational motto of SERP has been getting the water right. As in the Bay Delta, historic flows in the Everglades shown here in the left panel have been massively altered. This is the current flow in the Everglades in the middle through diversions and structural changes to the system, including the extensive construction of levees and canals. A vision for a restored system, shown here on the right, involves balancing the needs of water for agriculture and urban areas with ecosystem needs. And I like this cartoony diagram because it very much reminds me of some of the water conveyance diagrams that are available for the state of California. In this cartoon, the tic-tac-toe thing on the lower left corner stands for quantity, quality, timing, and distribution, which reminds us that there are these many dimensions to water. And indeed, a big component of the much publicized stalling of restoration progress in the Everglades is the difficulty in figuring out how to enhance flow quantity to Everglades National Park down here in the southern part of the system, while ensuring that the water, which comes from uh, the area around Lake Okeechobee, predominantly agricultural in the northern part of the system, is of adequate quality. Perhaps surprisingly, flow velocity itself was conspicuously absent from the initial discussions around water quantity, which revolved mostly around water level. One reason is that flows in the Everglades today are almost imperceptible, less than a centimeter per second. It's very hard to even see this flow when you're looking at the water, thanks to drainage and compartmentalization by levees. So flow velocities weren't regarded as important. But given the alignment of the remnant ridge and slough landscape structure with historic flows, the importance of actual flow seemed intuitive. However, this was something that had to be formally demonstrated if it was going to be incorporated into management oh. decisions in the overall restoration plan. Okay, explains why I had other problems. I think there's someone who doesn't have their mute on. Um, but how do you evaluate the importance of a process for which there's no modern reference? So at small scales, we can increase flows through extant vegetation communities using a combination of in situ flumes and pumps that we use to pull water through uh, in order to understand how vegetation controls flows and at what point the fluffy organic sediment at the bed begins to move. Uh, these processes are essential to include in large scale models of the Everglades, but they're processes that you won't find described in any fluid mechanics or geomorphology textbook. And so they needed to be tested and explored further in the field. But then how do we scale up this understanding to examine its impacts on the landscape? This is where modeling came in. Relatively simple models that captured the essential coupling between flow, vegetation growth, organic matter production, sediment transport, and nutrient dynamics suggested that only when flow transports sediment do we see a leveling off of vegetated area. So before I go much further, I'll explain what you're looking at in these plots. Uh, time is on the x-axis and the coverage of vegetation is on the y-axis. And one thing to note is that these different cases, the no-flow case with flow but no sediment transport, 
and with flow have different axis, uh, different ranges on the y-axis. So only when flows are sufficient to transport sediment do we achieve a patterned ridge and slough landscape with a relatively high coverage of open water areas uh, where the ridge coverage only gets to about 35%. The type of landscape degradation that we see in areas that have been cut off from flow here and here uh, does match what the model predicts as shown in this photograph of a degraded part of the ridge and slough landscape. But perhaps a little more useful than this graphical demonstration was the use of the model to explore how the landscape would evolve over a range of flow conditions. So the range of flow conditions is being depicted on the x-axis. And you could think of this axis as being proportional to a flow velocity. Um, we also explored how the landscape would evolve over a range of starting points in terms of vegetation coverage, which is being shown on the y-axis. The way to interpret this diagram is that uh, any of the white parts of the plot represent um, places where vegetation coverage is expanding over time whereas the black parts represent areas where vegetation coverage is stable over time. And in the gray areas, it's either expanding or stable depending on how you approach that region. Now what this analysis showed is that there's only a narrow range of flow velocities, about two to five centimeters per second, that promote the type of sediment redistribution needed to produce a ridge and slough landscape with broad channels and limited coverage, 30 to 50% of uh, ridges, um, and, and so this was a key piece of information that was actually used in planning an adaptive management experiment in which pulses of flow were reintroduced to a part of the landscape formerly isolated by two sets of levees. And that's being shown here. Here are the two sets of levees that cut off this area affectionately referred to as the pocket from the rest of the greater Everglades. Uh, the experiment, uh, which is known as the DPM or decompartmentalization physical model, we have our terrible acronyms too in the Everglades, uh, was designed as a BACI experiment or before-after control impact. This is a statistical experiment where the effects of the impact, which here is, is introduced, uh, is these introduced flow pulses, are quantified by comparing an impacted site to control sites that did not experience the flow release and in which monitoring is completed from before the period of flow releases to after the period of flow releases shown in blue. This experiment was designed to take place over the six years shown here, but it's actually ongoing to this day due to continued funding. Part of the experiment was designed to test uncertainties associated with flow introduction and sediment redistribution, while another part was designed to test practical engineering and hence economic uncertainties about the extent to which the canals cutting across the flow path needed to be backfilled. During the first flow release, we added green dye to visualize how the water moved through the affected area, which led to the sensationalist Miami Herald news headline, giant green blob invades the Everglades. But what did we learn, scientifically speaking, from this experiment? Well, along a ridge to slough transect, being shown here as the x-axis, we saw high velocities in the sloughs with the flow releases, up to about six centimeters per second. So velocities after the flow release are being shown by this orange line. Whereas before the flow release in the blue line, um, flow velocities were only a fraction of a centimeter per second. The flow release was accompanied by high bed shear stresses shown in the orange bars. Um, that were high enough to initiate sediment transport represented by the orange bars being above this dashed line. We took this data shown in the plot on the day of the flow release, but the situation actually got a little bit better over time. So I'm starting the video, which you could hopefully see. Um, early on in the video, uh, you saw that the sloughs were entirely occupied with um, a bladderwort, utricularia, that's coated with microbes, giving it the appearance of pond scum. And this is the type of vegetation community composition in the sloughs that our models were based off of. Uh, the epi this epiphyton is really important ec ecologically as it serves as the base of the ecosystem, but it also creates a lot of drag on the flow. What we saw, though, as you could see in this video, is that once we reintroduce flow, we see a, a relatively rapid clearing, which makes it even easier to achieve higher flows as the clearing occurs. So the question now is, does this actually transport sediment in a way that we believe is necessary for landscape development? Our as-of-yet unpublished results suggest yes. 
What we see is that a few hours into the flow release, a lot of very small particles, particle size is being shown in these blue lines, uh, typical of epiphyton or the pond scum, become, become mobilized as evidenced by these high suspended sediment concentrations within the slough until there are none left to mobilize anymore when we enter a period of source depletion. At that point, the sloughs are very clear and we see an increase in the size of the particles being transported over here. Here, the large fluffy organ organic flock is moving and this is what is needed to keep ridges from growing indefinitely wide over time. Because water quality is a critical part of quote unquote getting the water right, we also monitored the concentrations of nutrients and conservative ions in the water and then used a network modeling approach to understand the impacts of the canal backfill alternatives shown down here and the flow pulses. While I don't have time to get into the details of the network modeling, uh, hopefully this comes across to some extent in the diagram, but in short, what we found is that only when canals are completely backfilled do you promote connectivity of both nutrients and conservative solutes across the gap? Uh, and the other thing we found is that we, we found some evidence of phosphorus transforming the ecosystem a little bit further into the wetland than before the flow release. But these effects did taper off by around this location where my cursor is suggesting that appropriately engineered flow releases to constitute a viable means to restore the sediment redistribution process with only small ecological trade-offs. So in the Everglades, just adding water ended up being a helpful process, but one that was not simple by any means to orchestrate. Well-coordinated restoration science ended up keeping that task from being impossible. For the next vignette, I'm going to take you to two other parts of the country to illustrate projects that underscore the importance of understanding ecosystem restoration in a larger context, and particularly from understanding networks of cause and effect from source points high in the watershed to sinks further downstream. Certainly this is a lesson that has been well learned in Bay Delta science uh, through, for example, the tale of selenium. So first let's visit the Chesapeake Bay watershed where stream restoration is often applied in hopes of helping management jurisdictions meet their TMDL requirements for nutrients or sediment. Stream incision is a pervasive phenomenon in many of the urban and agricultural subwatersheds of the Chesapeake Bay associated with rampant erosion. Most instances of stream restoration follow a highly prescribed physical template in which hard engineering structures, including the cross veins that you see in this photograph, are used to design channels of particular slope, width, and meander wavelength in order to ensure stability. These calculations are based on observations of channel patterns of rivers predominantly in the western U.S. but are applied widely throughout the east. I had the opportunity to conduct a comparative study on stream metabolism, an integrative measure of stream ecosystem health, and how it varied between neighboring watersheds with and without the in-stream restoration structures. What we found contributed to a much larger body of literature that suggests that this structural type of stream restoration often does not improve function, and this is key, particularly when it is done without stormwater controls higher in the watershed. In our case, we found that the unrestored stream, which did have watershed storm water controls, was more effective at retaining the amounts of organic matter and fine sediment needed to sustain critical biogeochemical functions in the stream bed in comparison to the restored stream. In the restored stream, we found high amounts of eroded bank sediment in transport during flow events, little retention of fines within the stream bed between storm events, which is a conclusion that we reached through a combination of sediment fingerprinting studies and fine sediment tracer tests. Zooming over to the West Coast, understanding hydrological connections between the watershed and what was happening in the stream was also critically important for addressing questions about how water management influenced the persistence of salmonids during the dry summer months. Seemingly identical pools would produce very different outcomes for fish with complete fish death. This is a, a dead uh, coho par uh, in some pools and nearly complete persistence in other pools. Field surveys and statistical modeling by Cleo Wolfley Erskine suggested that, perhaps not surprisingly, dissolved oxygen is a critical determinant separating these two outcomes. But what was surprising to us was the results of the water source tracking studies that followed. We were able to develop a statistical scoring system that indicated groundwater influence on pools. And what we found is that all of the pools to which salmon recruited at the beginning of the summer and persisted in through the end of the summer had a persistent groundwater influence and that the shallow groundwater inflow actually helped maintain higher levels of dissolved oxygen in those pools, which was surprising to us. 
We need to expand this study further, but it seems that at least here, the fish cued their behavior on the presence of groundwater inflow. So maintaining high levels of groundwater in those watersheds might be just as important, if not more important, to salmon conservation as surface water flows. There's been a lot of talk and debate about the role of novel ecosystems and restoration efforts, including in the Delta ecosystem. My experience with these restoration projects has led me to embrace the concept of novel ecosystems, given that the combination of stressors in these ecosystems, given that the combination of stressors that these ecosystems are experiencing from climate change and other anthropogenic change is so radically different from anything in their immediate past. Restoration often focuses on restoring a historic ecosystem structure, but given the novel combination of stressors, restored function does not often follow. Rather, we often need to flip the equation on its head and design a novel ecosystem structure in order to restore function. Going back to the example of the Everglades, restoring historical landscape structure would have required removing these barriers to flow in the form of levees and canals an approach that was strongly promoted or advocated for by some stakeholder groups. If, however, the ultimate objective was restoration of the historic function of sediment redistribution for purposes of maintaining remnant rigid slough habitat, like the one you see here, that objective would not have been achieved by a removal of levees and canals. For one, there are fewer available inputs of water to sustain those flows, which would result in lower overall water levels conducive to the choking of waterways with even more emergent vegetation, including invasive cattail. Secondly, flow velocities under these conditions would be slower than they were historically because of vegetative drag from the existing emergent vegetation occupying former sloughs and likely not sufficient to redistribute sediment. Now, one of the key characteristics of nonlinear environmental systems is that they're often characterized by irreversible trajectories of behavior such as this. Taking all of this into account, we could slightly redesign the compartmentalized structure of the Everglades to put in these gated culverts and then use them to build up a head differential in the water that allows us to do pulsed flow releases as in the DPM flow experiment. These short-term releases do mimic historic short-term flood pulses from the periodic overflow of Lake Okeechobee up here and do have sufficient energy to redistribute sediment. So novel ecosystem structures aren't always a bad thing when it comes to management for certain ecosystem functions. However, it's often assumed that ecosystems composed of invasive species do have diminished function with a strong focus on eradication of those invasives, an approach that, by the way, seems entirely appropriate here in the Delta based on the studies that have been done here. However, with respect to the management of some species, such as tamarisk and western rivers, this approach has been strongly critiqued, and it is striking to me how strongly this approach diverges from approaches to ecosystem management elsewhere in the world, uh, even as close, to, as close to the U.S. as places like the Luquillo Reserve in Puerto Rico, uh, where abundant populations of invasives are recognized as filling ecological niches in their own right and eradication is not pursued, perhaps because of its acknowledged impracticality. So how well have we really quantified the function of invasives in these novel ecosystems that are often the focuses of, of our large-scale Everglade or <laughs> of our large-scale restoration efforts. This was a, a question that we that we pursued with respect to sedimentation and land building in southern Louisiana. There, we used lidar remote sensing imagery to provide us with spatially explicit information about the topography and structure of wetland vegetation canopies and how they changed over a period of time with significant river flooding. Then we applied a technique that is becoming more commonly used in the environmental sciences to resolve feedback processes from time series data, as I'm now doing with the boreal peatland data set in Finland and my group is doing with the streamflow and hydrometeorological data set across the continental US. Here though, my graduate student Hong Shu Ma adapted the approach to draw upon spatially explicit remote sensing data. We were interested in which species exerted control over changes in elevation in the Wax Lake Delta. In other words, in which vegetation communities does knowledge of the physical structure of vegetation canopies reduce uncertainty about future elevations, depicted here as an arrow going from right to left? We found that vegetation promoted sedimentation in place only in rooted native vegetation with extensive biofilm, but that invasive vegetation communities, shown in, in red, uh, that replaced the natives, including water hyacinth here, which of course is a, a problem species in the delta, did not fulfill the same ecogeomorphic function. This finding may provide an even stronger impetus for management of invasive species in places like the Wax Lake Delta. <laughs> 
So getting back to the cross-cutting messages, even as we look forward to try to anticipate and understand the novel ecosystems of the future and their functions, it is also important to keep one foot in the past. My next examples will show how historical knowledge leads to nature-inspired restoration designs and may expand ideas of what is possible in restoration efforts. Regarding the latter, there was initially a lot of pushback around the idea of setting flow velocity targets for Everglades restoration in support of maintaining a patterned ridge and slough landscape. The reasons were twofold. One was that this landscape may have been naturally undergoing a gradual transition to a more homogeneous state. And another was that intuitively it seemed difficult to imagine flows in the very flat Everglades that were actually sufficient to transport sediment. But paleoecology and historical ecology quieted both re re reasons for pushback. Pollen records and sediment cores analyzed by Chris Bernhardt and Deb Willard at the USGS told us that the ridge and slough landscape features were persistent at the millennial time scale. Meanwhile, the work that Chris McVoy at the South Florida Water Management District did to per peruse the historical archive revealed that the Everglades experienced periods of substantial flow historically, and there were even rapids on the Miami River shown in this extraordinary photograph. These works expanded our idea of what it may be possible for restoration to achieve. Back in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, historical ecology has inspired an innovative new approach to stream restoration that is quite different from the approach that I discussed earlier. Working in the floodplains of the incised streams that I talked about before, like this one, uh, as being so abundant in this watershed, my collaborators Dorothy Merritt and Bob Walter noticed that this black organic rich layer that you could see in the photograph was, fair, was present fairly ubiquitously in the incised banks throughout the East Coast. Sedge seeds preserved in the sediment suggested that formerly these stream systems were relatively low energy, boggy wetland environments like this, uh, rather than the typical single threaded meandering streams that we are so quick to envision in the region today. By probing historical documents then, they realized that the widespread construction of mill dams and the associated formation of mill ponds behind the mill dams had buried these historic wetlands and that much of the modern incision of streams is a result of the removal of these historic structures or uh, as a result of them just falling into disrepair, which leaves a stair step in the floodplain that would then erode headward. This realization led to the proposal of a radically different type of stream restoration in which the legacy sediment is fully removed from the floodplain, as you can see in this LIDAR image. This re-exposed historic seeps and springs and in this plan, the channel was actually designed to go over bank and cut new paths through the floodplain rather than being held in place as a stable entity. This strategy for restoration was deployed as a pilot at Big Spring Run near Lancaster, Pennsylvania. While our team is still collectively working up the results, the preliminary analyses are exciting. New channels have formed on the floodplain, as you can see in this imagery, as hoped for in the initial design. Also, sedges from the original hydric layer that were not planted as a part of the restoration are returning to the landscape. The stream reach has converted from a net source of sediment to a net sink, and it appears that rates of nitrogen and phosphorus retention and removal have increased substantially. As a final word on the importance of historical understanding of the landscape, my now former PhD student, Aaron Beller, recently conducted a meta-analysis of the historical ecology literature while this is a small body of literature, she found that nearly a quarter of the 200 papers she reviewed contained a recommendation that challenged status quo management just from this historical information. In addition to the brainstorming and horizon scanning that are so often discussed as integral to restoration science in a rapidly changing environment, I would argue that it is also important to scan your rearview mirror. Last and relatedly, I would argue that the most exciting innovations in restoration science are nature-inspired designs that balance human and non-human needs. One example of that is, of course, the example of Big Spring Run in Pennsylvania, but another great example is the YOLO bypass, uh, which is certainly being managed innovatively now, even if it wasn't initially designed as a nature-inspired solution for meeting co-equal goals. Another example that I've been following closely is the use of beaver dam analogs as a tool for increasing water storage in stream valleys in places like the Scott Valley, California. As discussed in a recent overview paper by Ben Goldfarb in Science, 
the initially simple human intervention of building beaver dam-like structures like the one that you see here sets off a chain of naturally occurring reactions that eventually results in beavers reoccupying the floodplain, very high amounts of water storage and infiltration to groundwater, and a floodplain that is quite well connected to the channel. Natel Energy, a company from Alameda that my group is now collaborating with, is investigating the possibility of using beaver dam-like structures to generate hydropower in a distributed fashion, while also enabling fish passage and recreational activities, creating wetland and riparian habitat in the regions upstream of these low head dams, and promoting groundwater recharge. And this work is in response to a recent call from the Department of Energy to develop standard modular hydropower technology that achieves such diverse objectives. With that, I'm going to switch gears and segue into the third part of my talk, which outlines my vision for the Delta lead scientist position. Since learning that I would be interviewed, I've spent a lot of time trying to learn the landscape of Delta restoration science, and happily, there are many amazing ongoing efforts to build on. Forgive me, though, if I've missed some of this current work in my attempts to get up to speed. So first of all, this, the science action agenda emphasized the importance of synthesizing, integrating across, and expanding upon existing modeling used in support of Delta science. And this is something that I would eagerly work with the Integrative Modeling Steering Committee to achieve. Although the cascade modeling effort already uses some scenarios, I would hope to work with a larger community of modelers and non-modelers in the scientific community to outline more formal scenarios for management and climate alternatives, analogous to the RCP scenarios adopted by the climate modeling community that you see here on the right. This scenario development would build upon the climate synthesis that was a part of the recent ecosystem amendment to the Delta Plan and would ideally be done in a coordinated, two-way manner with the identification of adaptive management opportunities. Thus, I see one of my roles as being a bridge between the Integrative Modeling Steering Committee, QEMPF, and the Collaborative Adaptive Management Team, as well as a liaison between those teams and also the, the broader scientific community. In my own career, I've done a lot of thinking about how to make modeling and model results more accessible, open, and reproducible. And in this respect, I've been inspired by what the Earth surface process modeling community has achieved through CSDMS or systems, uh, which stands for the Community Surface Dynamics Modeling System, funded through NSF. And this is a screenshot of one of their websites. In addition to chairing regular workshops and serving as a highly used repository for model code, CSDMS now includes a web-based interface that allows for coupling or daisy-chaining different types of Earth system models, for instance, a sediment transport model with a flow or solute transport model. I look forward to working with the Integrative Modeling Steering Committee on their efforts to improve model interoperability and potentially seeking funding for model infra cyber infrastructure development, uh, perhaps similar to what is available through CSDMS or using some of the tools available through this particular interface. One of the things that I would be very keen to advance, having been deeply immersed in this world at Berkeley for the past five years, is the reproducibility and accessibility of Delta science. This is really important because accessibility and reproducibility are essential in getting our science disseminated, understood, and used. I know that the passage of uh, AB 1755 has galvanized a lot of great efforts in this community, in this area. But I would argue that we have the opportunity to break new ground here and go even further, particularly because of the Delta's geographic location in the Bay Area, a data science hub. Berkeley recently received its largest donation in history, earmarked for advancing data science initiatives, and even though I hate to admit it, Stanford ain't so bad either in this respect. I can attest that there are many students who would like to use their data science knowledge to make a positive difference in the world, and many of those show a strong interest in working on environmental challenges. One thing that may be beneficial to ongoing efforts in the Delta would be to assemble a panel of experts, both local and non-local, to periodically review and infuse with new ideas efforts in the areas of data reproducibility and accessibility. The panel of experts might include someone like Deb Peters, whose vision for open environmental science I found inspiring and uh, who produced the graphic shown on this slide. She proposes using machine learning to analyze how people interact with data resources in order to predictably build efficiency and accessibility as more users undertake successful analyses, including things such as prefetching data or recommending data sets before they're requested, as well as the other strategies listed on the left-hand side of this slide. 
I cannot overemphasize the importance of focusing on the whole pipeline of doing science and reproducibility initiatives rather than just making the original raw data sets available. And I'm going to get on my soapbox here for a little bit, but in a reproducibility class that I taught at Berkeley in 2018, data science grad students tried to reproduce analyses in some of the papers that the instructors, Max Offhammer, um, uh, an environmental ec economist and I had identified as being the best examples of peer-reviewed, reproducible environmental science. And only rarely were the students successful, mainly because the pipeline was often insufficiently transparent. Certain initiatives are in place already to address that problem and provide scientists with easy-to-use intuitive resources for disseminating their whole research process. One of these is the Pangeo Initiative, which is spearheaded by Fernando Perez at Berkeley. We're currently collaborating on an NSF-sponsored project to build use cases for common data processing tasks on large data sets in the earth sciences. And I could see a lot of potential for using tools such as this to promote utilization of the IEP and other monitoring and modeling data sets in the Delta as well. So in these use cases, um, some of the tasks that are made available to the community are things such as fetching data, gap filling, and compiling data in a common format um, that's then readily uh, inputable to, st to statistical analyses. Relatedly, once the data sets and common processing tools are readily available, it becomes increasingly easy to incentivize their utilization. There are good examples of this already in the California water scene, such as the California Water Data Hackathon recently run jointly by Berkeley and the State Water Resources Control Boards. DWR has also sponsored water innovation contests, which turns out to make a great class project for undergraduate hydrology and water resources students. These crowdsourcing initiatives can be a great benefit, I think, to horizon scanning uh, and also the production of useful data visualization tools or other tools that bridge the gap between scientists and stakeholders. While on the topic of the utilization of data, one additional thing that might be worth pushing for is the integration of data generation from the monitoring network with the display of results relevant to the identified performance measures. To the extent possible, it would be useful to visualize that information in a spatially explicit way, perhaps with uh, near real-time integration and perhaps with an added layer of interpretation such as the red, yellow, green stoplight rating of nutrient effects on ecological processes seen here in this Everglades example. And this is by uh, my colleague Evelyn Geyser at Florida International University. One of my top priorities, though, as Delta lead scientist would be to ensure the continuance of the funding program started by John Calloway. As a possible mechanism for new funding, I would like to explore the possibility of partnering with program managers in NSF's Coupled Natural Human Systems Program or with the Social Ecological Synthesis Center, or SUSINC, in Annapolis, Maryland. At a minimum, I would also like to brainstorm how to provide some form of support or incentives to the scientific community here to galvanize submission of a Coupled Natural Human Systems proposal uh, by members of, of the community. I think it is important to have an ongoing, far-reaching discussion about what needs to be prioritized in future funding calls. And I know that John has done this in the, uh, in the most recent funding call. For example, riffing off of priorities already established in the Science Action Agenda, uh, these include things like understanding the function of and anticipating novel ecosystems, understanding the impacts of changing water quality, and uh, also topics that deal with delta landscape ecology. Another thing that could be worth investing in is work on the optimal design or even the adaptive redesign of monitoring networks. And when I talk about adaptive redesign, um, I think Stefan Krauss in the hyd hydrologic community does a good job of outlining how monitoring networks that are adaptive in their spatial or temporal resolution are important in their ability to capture events that might be missed otherwise um, by traditional monitoring networks. So the idea here is to establish certain triggers that allow for more frequent sampling in space or more spatially, uh, sorry, more, more frequent sampling in time or more spatially intensive sampling. Fortunately, the continued evolution of sensor and control technology makes these strategies increasingly more realistic to implement. Last, given the recent flux in water policy in California, I would be remiss not to mention plans to engage with the voluntary agreements to improve habitat and flow in the Delta and its watersheds. 
while it is difficult to anticipate what that will look like at this time, I thought that it has been especially reinf reinforced by my meetings thus far. Uh, I think it is quite possible that we may be asked to form panels and provide syntheses in support of the development of the agreements and that this could become a substantial part of my overall role as Delta lead scientist. And finally, with that, I would like to open up the floor to questions. All right. Thank you, Lauren. So we have, uh, sorry, Laurel. Um, so we have a, a slide up that uh, provides directions for how to submit questions. There's an opportunity to type questions using the WebEx chat function or to submit an email to disb at deltacouncil.ca.gov. And just for my information, our, um, are you going to be fielding the questions? Because right now the way I have my display set up, I can't see the chat box, although I can certainly change that. Um, yes, we'll be um, fielding the questions. Okay, thank you. So we currently have some questions um, from Chief Kelly Fisk. She has three questions, but I'll read them one at a time for you to respond, Laurel. I'm um, sorry, uh, who, who did you say the questions were from? Chief Colleen Fisk. Okay, thanks. Um, her first question is, did you say invasive cattail? Is that the same as Thule? These are native to the Delta. Uh, I, I did say invasive cattail. Uh, and it is not the same species as the Thule that we have in the Delta. Um, in Florida, the cattail are actually native, um, but their spread has become uh, greatly accelerated as a result of water quality changes. Um, her next, the next question is, are the beavers in the plan to build their own dams? Say that again, are, are, are the beavers what? Are the beavers in the plan to build their own dams? So if you're uh, referring to the Natal Energy Collaboration, no. Um, the intent there would be to either use existing low head dams um, or to identify places where new low head dams that promote fish, fish passage could be put in. Um, if the question refers to the work in the Scott Valley and many other places that are using the term beaver dam analogs, uh, yes, uh, the intent is for at some point the beavers to reoccupy the floodplain and to promote the continued uh, construction of dams, uh, which will enhance storage of water and infiltration to groundwater. So I hope that it that gets at your question. Um, and, her, and the last question is, did you say that you studied the underground springs in the Delta floor? Um, no, not in the Delta. Um, there are two places uh, where our work has involved groundwater exchange and, and springs. Uh, one example that I mentioned was at Big Spring Run in Lancaster, Pennsylvania where removal of the legacy sediment that had accumulated in the, in the floodplains behind the historic mill dams did, did re-expose the historic seeps and springs. And those are things that contributed to the formation of new channels cutting across the floodplain and enhanced connectivity between the main channel and the rest of the floodplain. Um, the other example that I mentioned uh, was in the coastal California intermittent streams uh, where we found that points of groundwater inflow, and this is shallow groundwater inflow to the stream pools, uh, which is a type of spring, um, did promote the dissolved oxygen conditions conducive to the over summer survival of young coho salmon and steelhead trout. Thank you. And Chief Kelly Sisk also responded with improving habitat and flow must also include eradicating the invasive species that are killing the river canopy. Bird, fish, and water bugs are in the study. I agree with that. We also have um, questions from Lisa Thompson from Regional Fan. Um, 
her questions are in the adaptive management experience sorry, in the, in, in the adaptive management experience, experiment in which you have been involved, how was new information conveyed to stakeholders? Yes, yeah, so in the Everglades, this was done in several ways. I, I was a part of a science coordination team uh, that had regular meetings, monthly meetings to discuss progress. Uh, managers at the Army Corps of Engineers in the South Florida Water Management District were also involved in those meetings. Um, and they were some of the people who had the power to determine uh, how those on the ground efforts would adapt to the results that were emerging from those studies. Um, another way that, that this uh, two-way interaction happens in the Everglades is through regular uh, meetings between the whole scientific community and the whole community of managers. And that has actually been a pretty effective way to disseminate new science in the Everglades. I hope that answers the question. And her next question is, how was this new scientific information acted upon by policymakers? So this is still an ongoing study. Um, one of the, the plans in the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Project um, was to gradually decompartmentalize the Everglades. Initially, one plan was to remove, uh, or, or I'm sorry, to elevate the Tamiami Trail, which cuts across the southern, elevated, the, the, the southern Everglades just upstream of Everglades National Park um, due to funding challenges, um, the length of that proposed project has gradually diminished from the whole length of the Tamiami Trail to a 10-mile bridge, to a 2-mile bridge, to a 1-mile bridge. Um, so there are these bureaucratic and funding-related challenges. Um, but the plan is for the decompartmentalization physical model um, to inform those larger-scale decompartmentalization efforts. One of the things that we've learned that I didn't talk about today, um, and we suspected this first through the modeling, but then uh, this was reinforced through the field experimentation we did, is that if you have a landscape that is already degraded in which emergent vegetation fully occupies the sloughs, uh, it's very difficult to go back to an open water habitat. So we've been seeing these pulsed flow releases as a way to maintain existing landscape structure rather than to actually restore landscape structure that is considered degraded. But one of the things that has, one of, one of the ideas that's been floated around in the scientific community is the idea of doing more intensive management of that emergent vegetation. Um, either through mechanically cutting new paths, uh, new uh, incipient sloughs, or through burning that vegetation. And that's actually something that we've had an opportunity to test with the continuation of the decompartmentalization physical model experiment. So um, some of our group underwent the very arduous task of <laughs> using a machete, essentially, to cut a new um, incipient slough or, or waterway uh, in, into a ridge in the area that is affected by these flow releases and found that flow velocities and sediment transport were quite high in that area. So, so whether this is a strategy that's going to be deployed at much larger scales is still a topic that is under discussion. Thanks, Laurel. We also have a question from Ben Geske from the Delta Science Program. Sure. It sounds like it sounds like you have read some of the modeling synthesis work recently released by the Integrated Modeling Steering Committee. What do you think are some of the important near-term components or actions needed for a successful virtual collaboratory? This is a great question. Um, I'll admit that in the fire hose of information that I've been reading, I have not been able to read those documents in great detail. Um, but I think one component of an effective strategy is to, to form uh, working groups within the scientific community um, that are essentially communities of modelers working on common tasks. So this wouldn't be all modelers together. It would be modelers who might be focused on flow, modelers who might be focused on uh, vegetation dynamics, and so on. Um, and within those working groups, 
uh, there needs to be, within each of those individual working groups, there needs to be an agenda, but then there needs to be a, a regular um, gathering together of the community of modelers as a whole. Um, I think there are some cyber infrastructural needs, too, that could really enhance the process of um, different members of the modeling community working together. Um, and one of the nice things about the CSDMS example is that the funding that that um, program received from the National Science Foundation was able to provide for some staff members who could work with scientists to uh, recode their models or to document their models um, so that they were in a common language and uh, in, in a form that was able to work with the, the integrated modeling interface that I showed on the slide. Um, so that's another helpful thing. And then I think a, a third component of maybe improvement or the plan that's needed is an open, open lines of communication between the modeling communities and the communities of, of stakeholders. Uh, we have a huge challenge here in the Delta ecosystem in, in the sense that um, objectives for management um, can occasionally clash very strongly among the different stakeholder groups and, um, and it's very difficult to put together a model that addresses all of those objectives and all of those state variables. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure what, what exactly the right answer there is, but I think the structure of how this two-way communication between modelers and stakeholders um, happens is something that uh, needs to be worked out. Thanks, Laurel. We also have two questions from Ted Summer from DWR. Um, I'll read them both first, and then I can repeat one at a time if you need me to. Okay. Um, the first this is, in, this is in reference to your Everglades work. Um, mm -hmm. So the, D, the first question is, the DPM flowway work sounds fascinating. Was, t was the targeted zone tidally influenced? And the second question is, um, sounds like there may have been some follow-up work using the flow structures in the Everglades. Could you elaborate on what the structures were and how they were used for flow experiments? Okay, yes. I'm just making a few notes so that you don't have to repeat those questions. Um, the first question I'll address is the first question um, about whether the flowway was tidally influenced. And I should have said this in my talk, but no. Uh, the portion of the Everglades that I have worked in most extensively is completely non-tidal. Um, the second question is uh, a request to elaborate on the structures that were used um, and I, th I think there was another part to that question. Uh, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I'll read it again. Sounds like there may yeah. have been some follow-up work using the flow structures. Oh, follow-up work. Like, yeah. Could you elaborate okay. on what the structures were and how they were used for flow experiments? Yes. So the area in which the flow experiment was done um, was formerly uh, a set of two levees and canals. So there was a levee and canal pair in the upstream location and a levee and canal pair in the downstream location. Uh, the action that was done was to install uh, gated culverts. And unfortunately, I don't know a better engineering term than that. Um, but to install a, gated, a set of gated culverts in the upstream levee and then to remove uh, the a part of the downstream levee to create a relatively large gap through which the sheet flow would flow. Um, and then in the canal that was paired with that downstream levee, uh, the bottom of the canal was backfilled to varying degrees. And this, this is actually pretty difficult and expensive to do. And so one of the uncertainties that we were testing is just how far do you need to backfill those actual canals. Um, so the idea is that, well, first of all, we think that the gated culverts that can be closed are really essential. Uh, one of the biggest hurdles that we had in this adaptive management experiment was to demonstrate that the water quality flowing through those culverts was going to meet these very strict requirements for phosphorus uh, that are enforced uh, for the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan. Um, 
And this was a big concern because a fear was that uh, canal water, which tends to be much richer in phosphorus, as it's often draining the agricultural area, um, would seep into the wetland and have detrimental effects, including promoting the invasion of cattail. Um, so in the design of this adaptive management experiment, the South Florida Water Management District and Army Corps of Engineers underwent extensive flow and solute transport modeling to anticipate effects or to anticipate concentrations of phosphorus that would be released into the, in, into the wetland. Um, and one of the insights that was gained from that piece of preliminary modeling work is that there's a narrow window of time in early November so late October, early November, uh, in which concentrations of phosphorus in the canal are naturally lower. And even if a substantial portion of canal water made it into the wetland, um, phosphorus concentrations would meet these very strict, uh, this very strict 10 parts per billion requirement that's enforced for the Everglades as a whole. And so um, I guess that's a long-winded answer, but as we think about scaling up the results of this experiment, I think maintaining that water quality is going to be one of the biggest hurdles and having these gated, cul these gated culverts is uh, going to be essential in meeting that challenge. Thank you. We also have a question from Susan Tatayan from the interview panel. Her mm -hmm. question is, can you give us another example of integrating monitoring network information into performance measures display? The data, visualization, the data visualization you spoke of. Yeah, let me, let me think about that for a moment, Susan. Um, so one of the things, so I, I, I've spent a little bit of time on the Delta Stewardship Council's webpage looking at um, the different performance measures and uh, the graphs that are associated with them that display the extent to which they're met or not met over the past few years. Um, and one of the things that strikes me is that if someone was looking to obtain some of the most up-to-date information coming from the monitoring network, that I, I don't know if that's present or not, but it was difficult for me to find. Um, and so one thought might be, having visualizations that are maybe just as simple as um, showing the current position of uh, the X2, uh, for example, or um, showing concentrations of monitored nutrients, which might be particularly important as we think about some of the upcoming water quality changes uh, for the Delta region. Um, and I think this would be particularly nice because if, if this is something that was accomplished, it can go a long way towards advancing um, some of the forecasting, some of the both ecological forecasting, water quality forecasting, and water quantity forecasting uh, that I know is a growing emphasis in the scientific community. One of the um, one of the scientific groups that I interact with a lot in my career right now is an ecological forecasting group. Um, and real-time ecological forecasting is, I would say, a, a growing initiative nationwide. And I, I think this is one thing, relatively small thing, but one that takes a lot of infrastructure and a lot of work to implement um, that could really advance us towards doing uh, near real-time ecological forecasting. So we have three more written questions. Um, this one is from Mike Chakowsky, also from the interview panel. Mm -hmm. um, have, have, adaptive man sorry, have adaptive monitoring approaches been adopted to a significant degree in the long-term monitoring done in the Everglades or Chesapeake systems? If so, what kinds of monitoring are being done that way at present? Um, so to some extent, and I, I'll confess that I don't know very much about the larger water quality monitoring networks used in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, in the Everglades, I would say that this uh, adaptive monitoring strategy is, is not something that has been used to a large extent that I could think of. Um, in the Chesapeake Bay, though, I, I can uh, talk about some of the uh, sediment water quality stations that the USGS has installed throughout um, the Chesapeake Bay area and 
one of the things that they have been designed to do is uh, targeted sampling during storm events, um, which is where most of the action happens in these systems. Uh, these streams tend to be very flashy, transporting a lot of sediment and, and nutrients during storm events. And so um, ISCO um, samplers have been set up to be triggered uh, when stream flows reach a particular level. So that's an example of um, uh, an adaptive monitoring scheme uh, that's adaptive in time. But other than that, I, I can't think of examples off the top of my head, but that might be because I'm not too incredibly immersed in that monitoring network today. And we have two more questions from Chief Colleen Fisk. Um, the first okay. one is, do you know how many underground springs there are in the Delta? I do not off the top of my head. And her next question, oh, sorry, the next question is, does the study include water quality at ag discharge areas and the results on the river system habitat? And how will the sloughs be cleaned and reestablished for juvenile salmon to use? So this is in reference to the Delta, I imagine? Um, it doesn't specify. Um, so, Chief Colleen says, if you were like, oh, is the Everglades similar to Delta? Is her next is the next question. Okay, could you read the first question for me again, please? Does the study include water quality at ag discharge areas and the results on the river system habitat? And how would the sloughs be cleaned and reestablished for juvenile salmon to use? Okay, I'm just making notes. So I do think it's, so, so answering the first part of that question um, about water quality at agricultural discharge areas and whether that is something that we should monitor, um, I do think that a monitoring network needs to be spatially comprehensive and include uh, sampling points that represent the diversity of inputs into the system. So, if those agricultural areas were serving as a point, a major point or non-point uh, source of input to the delta, which I think they are, um, some of the sampling stations would need to reflect their influence. Uh, I, I think it's particularly particularly important to include the influence of wastewater treatment plants in that monitoring network. Um, the second part of the question are about how sloughs. Um, can be cleaned and managed for juvenile salmon. Uh, this is something that I would really need to get up to speed on if I were to step into the position of Delta lead scientist um, and really uh, assemble some experts from the scientific community to be able to address. So my short answer to that question is I don't know at this point, but that is something I would be working with a number of people to. Um, to uh, try to establish recommendations. Um, thank you. Liz, I'm not sure if you want to, um, since it's already 1032, I'm not sure if you want to briefly open up the teleconference line to see any members of the public have comment that's on the teleconference line. Um, sure. So, uh, at, right, at this point, we will um, conclude the, the questions on the seminar, but we, we will, since, since this is a meeting, uh, a public meeting, we will allow for questions, comments from, from the public. So. We actually have two more questions from online now. From from uh, members of the public? Yeah. Okay. Um, let's one is let's from, go ahead. Um, these are for Laurel. So the first question is from Mike Wade. What role does control of invasives play in restoration activities in an ecosystem? So 
there, there are a number of diverse roles that control of invasives can play. Um, one is simply the establishment of habitat for uh, species that um, we are hoping to promote. Um, a lot of times, invasion uh, of these invasives uh, eliminates their habitat and um, and creates feedback processes that make it even more difficult for those species to reoccupy those areas in the future. And so that, that's a huge component. Um, another is that a lot of times these invasive species will, um, will change ecological functioning of a particular area. Uh, for instance, rates of sedimentation could change, rates of, of uh, nutrient transformation that impact overall water quality can change, and so controls of those invasives might reestablish important physical processes um, that then have bearing on um, species and habitats that we would like to promote. And then sometimes, if we're thinking more broadly, sometimes control of those invasives has important implications for uh, recreational opportunities as well. I think a lot of us are familiar with water hyacinths completely choking waterways and making them impassable for boating or other recreational activities. So Liz, um, just, just a time check, we do still have two more questions online, but I'm not sure if you want to transition over to the next part of our meeting. Hi, Edmund. Uh, yeah, I think we should try to keep things on schedule, but we can um, ask the, the people who are online if, they, if, if they're interested or, or willing to join the, the next session. and that would give them an opportunity to uh, spend more time getting to know the, the candidate. Yeah, we will do. And we can also follow up by email, too, with the written questions that haven't been answered. Yeah, I'd be happy to exactly. do that. Yeah. Well, th thank you so much, Laurel. That, that was a very uh, thoughtful and informative seminar, and uh, we appreciate the, uh, the new insights that you've brought to those of us who are members of the, the Delta Science community. So, so thank you. And, and thank you also for working with us in this remote format. You're welcome. And thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I wish I could see all of you, but it is a pleasure to have this interaction. So in, in terms of meeting logistics, at, at this time, we will uh, close the uh, brown bag seminar portion of the meeting. We will take a 10 minute break. So uh, that, that means that 10.45 uh, California time will we'll resume. And uh, at that time, we'll have a meet and greet opportunity with the Delta Lead Scientist applicant.